Hi. Good to see me. Key members of the U.S. women's soccer team have filed a lawsuit, a lawsuit, I say, against the U.S. Soccer Federation over the disparity in pay between the ladies and the men's U.S. soccer team. Is this sexism rearing its ugly head in sports, or is it something else completely? Here to weigh in, it's Hadley Heath Manning, a director of health policy at the Independent Women's Forum, a truly independent woman. Hadley, welcome back. Thanks, Kennedy. Good to be here. So let's discuss this a little bit. Now, when we talk about soccer at this level, the international level, the ultimate game, a global phenomenon, when we talk about the men's game versus the women's game, are we talking about the same thing? No, we're not. This is a common fallacy as it relates to sports in general. Feminists who watch the wage gap and compare men and women's earnings across industries typically use sports and Hollywood as examples of places where men and women are paid very differently. But I would argue that that's because the job descriptions for male and female actors or male and female athletes are actually different job descriptions for different roles on different teams and different leagues. And so because these two things are so different, we have to look at them really as two distinct industries with different market conditions and of course demand and revenue are part of those market conditions so speaking about sports very broadly there's greater global interest in men's sports than women's sports that means those sports typically generate more revenue and the yeah. payers are, are paid accordingly so uh, the women right. are saying you know we've won three world cups we've won four olympic titles the men have done none of that we get a huge global audience pay up or shut up soccer, U.S. soccer, um, but are the men making more? Are the men bringing more in? Well, it's a, it's a good question. It depends on which data point you're using because, of course, the women who filed this lawsuit would say in 2015, a year when the women's team won the World Cup, they brought in more revenue than the men's team. And if that's the case they want to make to their employer, I'd say go ahead. You have every right to negotiate and to collectively bargain for more pay. But I would caution against comparing, again, men and women's earnings in this regard. If the women's team in the United States is actually superior, brings in greater revenues, and that's you know maybe the future of, of the sport, yeah. then those women shouldn't be arguing for equal pay they should be arguing for greater pay than their male counterparts. That's a good point. Well, maybe it's a cultural problem. Maybe maybe there's uh, there's sexism that is pervasive among soccer fans. Maybe that's where they should be directing their energy. I don't know that it's necessarily a question of sexism, but it's, again, it's the difference between men and women as athletes are going to be more pronounced because it's a very physical industry. If you compare male and female accountants, you'll see a much smaller wage differential because the accountant job is one where you can easily interchange men and women. But when it comes to sports, men are doing something different from men. Uh, and again, I'm speaking very broadly about sports. It doesn't mean that those female athletes aren't working every bit as hard. It just means that the market conditions and the demand are different. You know, it's always bother me. Men and women get the, paid the same in uh, major tennis tournaments, yet the women only have to win in three sets. The men can go to five sets. And that, that, that has never sat well with me. Sometimes uh, pay parity is unequal. Well, let's shift gears to the New York State Legislature. They recently passed the nation's strongest and most comprehensive bill mandating paid time off for families with new children or sick relatives. Now, it sounds really great, right? But are there unintended consequences here, Hadley? Absolutely. This is the kind of law that will create winners and losers, and mostly losers, I would point out. So this is actually a law that goes further than a mandate. It doesn't just mandate that employers provide paid time off for women or men when they have a new child in the family, but it's actually creating a government-run insurance program, much like we see with the Social Security program, where workers have to pay in as part of a tax on each one of their paychecks. So yeah. there's, we're all losers in that in that regard. So but also, and, and do you have to pay into this pay even, even if you will never uh, take advantage of this benefit. You still have to pay in for other people who are going to take family leave. Exactly. All workers pay in. The benefits are available to women and men, but employers know that women are much more likely to take advantage of maternity leave than men are to take advantage of paternity leave. Yeah. So this could potentially affect women's hiring and um, getting pr promoted. All right. Very quickly, we're running out of time. How do family leave options improve without government interference? That's a great question, Kennedy. I'm glad you asked. When we see a more robust jobs market, then we are more likely to see employers offering flexibility and other options, paid time off, paid maternity leave, as many employers do today. But when employers are forced to compete for us as workers, then they will value us greater and offer us the benefits that we want. There's no need for government to come in here with a one-size-fits-all solution. Never works. Hadley Heath Manning, thanks so much for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you.